And more importantly, tonight's speaker, we're super excited to have Neri all here. Um, he's author of the best-selling book, Hooked, um, How to Build Habit-Forming Products is the subtitle. Um, I've seen him talk. He's an awesome speaker. I'm trying to not build up the expectations too high, but I've seen him talk. I'm really excited to have him talk. He's got great content. He's also been the CEO of two startups, so he really knows what he's talking about. And I think you guys should really enjoy his talk. So with that, let's welcome Neri all. Thanks everyone for coming tonight. This is a fantastic crowd. I appreciate you, you all coming out. Um, just a quick, another one more quick poll. Can you raise your hand for me if you've seen my talk before or read my book? Anybody? Wow. Well, first of all, thank you. Um, in that case, I think what I want to do, uh, since several of you have already read the book or, or seen the video, what I want to do is maybe give like just a high-level overview of the book. Uh, one of the things I hate when you go see an author speak is that they basically kind of recite the book to you, and, th and that's kind of a waste because you're all literate. You can go read it later. But I what I want to do is give plenty of time. Uh, Dan said that this group has a lot of questions, so I want to leave plenty of time for Q&A because I want to kind of hear what's on your mind, what kind of challenges you're struggling with. Uh, is it, does that sound okay? Just do kind of a quick overview and then dive right into Q&A? No, recite right. the book. Recite the book. <laughs> Page one. <laughs> all right. So if there's one thing we've all seen over the past several years is that these devices that we're carrying with us in our pockets these days have a profound impact on our day-to-day -day lives. They can profoundly change our day-to-day -day habits. And so what I've done over the past several years is to look for patterns, is to try and understand what is it about these devices, about these products and services that can so profoundly change our day-to-day -day habits. One of the first commonalities that jumped out at me is that many of these products, they start off as toys. They start off as things that are dismissed as somebody else's features or, you know, some little triviality. And yet within the span of a few short years, these products and services are touching the lives of hundreds of millions, if not a billion, users. And they're making hundreds of millions, if not billions, of dollars. So who am I talking about? What companies come to mind when I give this description? What's that? Right. Sold for $22 billion to Facebook. Right. Part of what makes a company like WhatsApp so valuable is that 74% of the people who have installed that app use it every single day. Talk about the tremendous economic value of these habit-forming products. What else? What other companies come to mind? Google. Yeah. Google, Snapchat, right? The, they turned down a $3 billion valuation. Now they're at 15. What else? Instagram, right, 12 people, 18 months, billion dollar sale, and I remember if, if many of you probably were in the valley when Instagram was sold for a billion dollars, and everybody kind of said, what, this silly little messaging service, a billion dollars Zuckerberg bought it for, right, it's crazy. Well, it turns out that about, what, about a month ago, a Wall Street uh, bank looked at what was the, what is the value today of Instagram. So if you were to separate Instagram from Facebook, you know how much it's worth? $35 billion, right? Who has the last laugh now? All right, so, and, and nobody said Facebook, the $230 billion behemoth. Right? The first time you saw Facebook, did you really think it would touch one in seven people on the face of the earth? Unbelievable. And there's companies in the enterprise space as well, companies like Slack uh, and Stack Overflow and GitHub, these companies that somehow can change users' habits. And so what I did for two years of my life was to look at what's, how do these companies do this? What's common? to these habit-forming products, and I codified what I learned inside this book. Uh, now, the book is 250 pages long, and I also teach a, a multi-week class at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford and the Design School there. So I've got the tough job tonight of condensing a lot of information into a little bit of time, but I'll try and give you a, a high-level overview of the model, of the, of the, the most important uh, questions that you should be asking yourself if you're building a habit-forming product. So let's get to started by understanding by getting all on the same page around what is a habit. When we use the term habit, what are we talking about? A habit is an impulse to do a behavior with little or no conscious thought. It's about half of what you do every single day, day in and day out, whether you like it or not, is done purely out of habit. And I believe that we are on the precipice of an age where we can use habits for good. And I'm not alone. Because today there is an explosion of companies, some of these companies might be represented by people in this very room, who are using the psychology of habit design to help people live 
happier, healthy, healthier, more connected, more productive lives. And so that's what I want to help you do tonight. So here's the pattern. The pattern is called the hook. Now, the hook is an experience designed to connect your user's problem to your solution with enough frequency to form a habit. So connecting your user's problem to your solution with enough frequency to form a habit. And it's through successive cycles, through these hooks, that customer preferences are changed, that our tastes are formed, and that these habits take hold. So I'm going to walk you through these four basic steps of these hooks that we find endemic to habit-forming technologies. Every hook starts with a trigger, to an action, through a reward, and finally an investment. So every hook starts with a trigger. A trigger is a cue to action. It tells the user what to do next, and these triggers come in two types, two flavors, if you will. We have our external triggers, and we have our internal triggers. Now, external triggers, you'll be very familiar with. I saw many of us are designers, PMs. You know all about external triggers. These are things in our environment that tell us what to do next. They give us some piece of information inside the trigger itself to tell us what to do. Click here, buy now, play this. A friend telling you about a great new app through word of mouth. All examples of these external triggers. Okay? So we product people know all about these external triggers, but what I find product people don't consider enough, and what turns out to be absolutely critical to forming these long-term habits, is creating an association with what's called an internal trigger. An internal trigger is something that tells the user what to do next. Okay? It cues the user to action, it prompts the habit, but the information for what to do is not stored in the trigger, as is the case with the external trigger. Instead, the information for what to do next is stored as an association or a memory inside the user's head. So what we do in response to being in a, to being in a certain situation, a certain place, partaking in a, in a certain routine, when we're around certain people, or most frequently when we experience certain emotions, dictates what we do next. And it's the emotions that are the most frequent internal triggers, but not just any emotion. Turns out the most frequent internal triggers are negative emotions. So what we do when we're feeling bored, or lonesome, or lost, or fatigued, or sad, what we do when we experience these negative emotions dictates the technologies that we turn to with little or no conscious thought. Now some of the research that shows this is the case comes to us from a great study that found that people suffering from depression check email more. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. Why is that? Why would people suffering from depression check email more? I actually see a few people putting away their phones right now. <laughs> but what, what's going on here? Why would people suffering from clinical depression Feel the, uh, check their email more. Well, what these psychologists found was that people suffering from depression experience what's called negative valence states. They feel down more often than the rest of the population. And so what are they doing to boost their mood to get out of this negative valence state? They're turning to their devices. They're going online. They're checking email more frequently than the rest of the population. And if we're honest with ourselves, we all do this to some degree. Right? What app or website do we check when we're feeling lonely? Where do we go? Tinder. Facebook, right. <laughs> you say Tinder? Okay, maybe Tinder. A little too long. A lot of people check, yeah, sure. They check Facebook, they check Tinder, sure. We check, these are the apps we check when we're feeling this internal trigger of loneliness, of seeking connection. What about when we're unsure about something? When we don't know the answer before we scan our brains, what are we doing? Google. Google it, right. And what about when we're bored? You know, between 2 and 4 o'clock in the afternoon, you have that big project you don't want to work on right now. Where do you go? Tinder. You go to YouTube. You check, you check Reddit. You check stock prices and sports scores. You check Pinterest and, new, and uh, fashion sites, right? There's all these solutions for this painful internal trigger of boredom. And we turn to our devices, we turn to these solutions with little or no conscious thought. Before we even recognize what's triggering us, we're already where we can find relief. 
with these products or services. So, what do we do with this? A bit of interesting pop psychology. I see some of you are kind of shaking your heads and saying, oh, I guess I kind of do use these products when I'm feeling these, these negative emotions. But I told you we can help people live happier, healthier lives by building better products. So how do we use this knowledge around internal triggers to build better products and services? Well, it comes down to fundamentally understanding what is your user's itch. And it's very hard to create this product that's used habitually, day in and day out, multiple times a day, unless you understand what itch it is you are scratching. So it's fundamental that you understand, that you can identify, that you can pinpoint what is the internal trigger. I can't tell you how many times in my consulting practice I work with a company where you know, the engineers can tell me all about the technical specifications of their product, all the functional requirements of what their product has to do, but when I, ask, when I ask about the psychological requirements around what pain this product is alleviating for the user, they haven't a clue. So we've got to understand what that internal trigger is. Let's do a case study. I don't like to keep with just theory. Let's look at, let's look at a, a product here. How many of you use Instagram? OK, great. A lot of people use Instagram. Terrific. So let's take a look at what made Instagram such a <coughs> habit-forming product. First, let's look at Instagram's external triggers. How did most people first find out about Instagram? How did, how did you first hear about it? What channels? Friends. Right, from friends, on Facebook, on Twitter. People posted their photos from Instagram onto these platforms. And there was a big button there telling you, hey, check out my photo on Instagram. That's an external trigger. It tells you what to do next. <laughs> you click on that button. You install the app. Now you have the external trigger on your phone. You start getting notifications from your friends. Those are all examples of external triggers. Now let's talk about the internal triggers. Did, did you say you use Instagram a lot? Yeah, quite a bit. Do you remember the last thing you took a picture of, if it's suitable for work? <laughs> <laughs> it is suitable. What is it? Uh, at like a little lake, basically. At a lake? Yeah. Was it like a, a, a sunset or something? Or? Uh, just kind of an afternoon. An afternoon, yeah, okay, yeah. an afternoon at the lake. Terrific. Now, and what's your name? Deepon. Deepon. Yeah. So I'm guessing that this lake did not say, Deepon, take a picture of me with Instagram. Right? Unless you were doing other things at the lake, perhaps. I don't know. <laughs> so what made Deepak suddenly decide to take out his phone and use Instagram to capture this image? Why did he decide? How did he know that Instagram was a solution? Well, he had this mental association in his mind that when there's this moment that I want to capture, when there's this fear that I might lose this moment, the solution is found with this app in his pocket, with Instagram. Instagram wins. Now, by the way, when I talk about the moment and capturing the moment, and particularly in the photography space, I think 20, 30 years ago, what other company comes to mind? Kodak, right? Do we all remember the Kodak moment? We're all about the same age. We were kids when Kodak used to run these commercials. Do we all remember these Kodak moment commercials? Right? The puppy dogs running through the grass, the kids who would someday leave the empty nest. My personal favorite commercial was the one they always had of grandma blowing out perhaps her last birthday candles. <laughs> you remember these? I'm not making these up. These were real commercials. Why did Kodak spend billions of dollars in advertising and almost a hundred years teaching people about the Kodak moment? Well, they were creating an association in people's minds that when you see a moment like this and you fear that it's going to disappear forever, capture it with the Kodak camera. Instagram did with 12 people in 18 months what took Kodak almost 100 years and billions of dollars by having us users teach other users what the Instagram moment is all about. But of course, Instagram does much more than the Kodak camera ever could because Instagram is also a social network. So the more we pass through Instagram's hook, the more we use a product like Instagram, the more we begin to associate it with other internal triggers. It's not just fear of losing the moment. It's about seeking connection. It's about boredom. It's about FOMO. What's FOMO? Fear, fear of missing out. Do you know that's a real word as of two years ago? It's actually in the Merriam-Webster dictionary. <laughs> FOMO feels bad. It's a negative valence state. We don't like that sensation that we might be missing out. And the solution to that discomfort is found with this app in our pockets. So that's how these companies form these associations with these internal triggers. Now, after the trigger phase of the hook comes the action, the behavior itself, where the habit is manifested. Now, the action phase is defined as the simplest behavior done in anticipation of a reward. 
The simplest behavior done in anticipation of reward. I'm going to show you a few examples of some habit-forming products. And I want you to see just how simple these actions are. Okay? So something as simple as scrolling on Pinterest, or searching on Google, or what could be easier than pushing the play button on YouTube. See how simple these actions are? These tiny little behaviors in anticipation of an immediate reward. Turns out there's actually a formula to help us predict these singular behaviors, and it comes to us from a researcher at Stanford by the name of BJ Fogg. Has anybody seen this before? A few folks? Oh, good. So most of you haven't. This is a, a pretty, pretty useful formula. Fogg tells us that for any human behavior B, three things must be present. We need sufficient motivation, sufficient ability. Ability is the A, how difficult or easy something is to do. And T stands for triggers. We just talked about triggers. So for any human behavior, it requires sufficient motivation, ability, and a trigger. Let's walk through. We just talked about triggers, but let's talk about motivation and ability. Now, motivation, according to Edward DC, who you see here, he's the father of self-determination theory, DC tells us that motivation is the energy for action, how much we want to do a particular behavior. Now, motivation is one of these areas of consumer psychology that we've been arguing about for decades and decades, but Fogg gives us these six basic levers that we can pull on to make a behavior more likely to occur by increasing motivation, because all of us seek pleasure and avoid pain. We seek hope and we avoid fear. We seek social acceptance and we avoid social rejection. So every television commercial you've seen, every ad copy, every billboard you've ever passed by, fundamentally uses one or more of these six elements of motivation. A lot more to be said about motivation for the sake of time. Let's move on to ability. Ability is the capacity to do a particular behavior, how easy or difficult a behavior is to do. And here again we have these six factors of ability that make a behavior more or less likely to occur based on how much time something takes, how much money something costs, how much physical effort is required to do the behavior. Brain cycles, this is a big one when it comes to technology products because the harder something is to understand, the less likely that behavior is to occur. Social deviance tells us that we become more likely to do something when we see other people like us doing it. And finally, we become mo more likely to do something in terms of non-routine simply for the fact that we have done it before in the past. Which is why the best predictor of what you will do tomorrow is what you did yesterday. Because the more we do a particular behavior, the easier it becomes and the more likely we are to do it in the future. What do we call that principle? called practice, right? The more we do it, the easier it gets, the more likely we are to do it in the future. So Fogg puts these three elements of motivation, ability, and triggers on this graph that's really useful in a product development context. If you're making you know, some wonderful new app or some great new website, but darn it, people aren't doing the thing you want them to do, right? They're not clicking, they're not progressing, they're not doing the intended behavior. Well, you can ask yourself, does the user have sufficient motivation? High motivation, low motivation. Does the user have sufficient ability? If something is easy to do, it's way over there, high ability. If something is hard to do, it's over here, low ability. And when the user has sufficient motivation and sufficient ability, they cross that threshold, that blue line, and when the trigger is present, the behavior will occur. Every single time, online, offline, your behavior, your significant other's behavior, your kid's behavior, your customer and user's behavior are all determined fundamentally by these three basic elements of sufficient motivation, ability, and triggers. Let's make this concrete. I want you to tell me the last time that a phone rang and you did not pick up the phone. Give me a reason why you didn't pick up the phone. Just shout it out. Why didn't you pick up the phone? You don't recognize the number. You don't recognize the number. Terrific. So that's an example of low motivation. Right? Even if you heard the phone ring, the trigger was present. Even if the phone was right there next to you, you have plenty of ability. <coughs> if you lack motivation, you don't cross that blue line, and the behavior doesn't occur. You don't pick up the phone. What's another reason why you may not pick up the call? I'm busy. You're busy. Terrific. Maybe you're listening to me talk right now. You're in the middle of something. You don't want to be the one person who takes out their phone and goes in between the aisles and says, oh, I've got to pick up the call. There's a lot of social deviance there. It's kind of awkward. It's difficult to do. You lack ability. It's hard to do that behavior. 
even if you have tons of motivation. Right? Even if you want to do that behavior, you don't do it because you lacked ability. It's too difficult to do. What's one more reason that has to do with a trigger, why you may not pick up a call? You didn't hear it. You didn't hear it. Terrific. Maybe the phone's on silent. Has that ever happened to anybody when you've got plenty of motivation, you really wanted to pick up that important call, and the phone was right there next to you, but you didn't hear it ring, and so you never pick up the call because no pr trigger was present? So for any human behavior, we always have to have sufficient motivation, sufficient ability, and a trigger, every click, every action, every behavior. Okay, make sense? Let's do another case study. Let's take a look at Twitter. So here's Twitter's homepage back in 2009. Here's Twitter's homepage back in 2010. And here's Twitter's homepage in 2015. Thinking about motivation, ability, and triggers, what jumps out at you? What's different from 2015 and, tw and 2009? What, what, do you, what jumps out at you as, as different? She looks more adventurous. Right, a lot, a lot of stuff, right? A lot of stuff on this page, whereas there's, it's a very simple design here, right? Very obvious what they want the user to do here. Let's take a look at this 2009 design, right? So back then, what was a trigger? It would take you to a different page and tell you all about what Twitter was, right? That was a, that was a you'd have to click it, go on a different page. And why it was a trigger, and how it was a trigger, and watch a video is a trigger, and science is a trigger, and click here is a trigger, and click here is a trigger, and gets turned and joins a trigger. That is a ton of cognitive load, that's a ton of thinking that the user had to do to figure out what it is exactly you want them to do here. And speaking of, what has always been the intended behavior in all three examples? What does Twitter want people to do? Sign in or sign up. That's always been the intended behavior. And what Twitter figured out was, by clearing the cognitive clutter, by making it easier for the user to figure out what it is you want them to do, they became more likely to do it. They reduce the cognitive load. Now I know what somebody's thinking. Somebody's thinking, yeah, but near. Back in 2009, nobody knew what Twitter was, right? People need an explanation. They need to be told that Twitter is a service for friends, family, co-workers, blah, 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 wrong. <laughs> Turns out that by talking, the, the, these interviews that I did with people who actually made this page and watched it evolve over the years, what they told me was that even back in 2009, people visiting Twitter.com never lacked motivation. Because remember, nobody typed in TWITTR.com and said, oops, what's this? Right? <laughs> that happened never. Right? People always came to that page. If they had typed in Twitter.com, they had always come to that page with plenty of motivation because they heard about it from a friend or they read about it or Oprah told them about it. They had tons of motivation. And so all Twitter had to do, as opposed to explaining and explaining, was just make the intended behavior easier to do, increase ability, and now they could increase conversion and send people through the four steps of their hook. Okay? So the lesson here isn't, hey, everybody build a landing page like Twitter. That's a short-sighted lesson. The lesson here is what's in your customer's way? What's in your user's path that's preventing them from taking the key action. And most of the time people come to me for consulting and they say, how do we motivate the user? And motivation is almost never the problem. Nine times out of 10, it's ability. Finding ways to make the intended behavior easier to do. Okay? So, we figured out the user's itch in the trigger phase. We prompted them to use, to take the key action, the simplest behavior that they do to get a reward. And now it's time for the reward itself, where the itch is scratched. When we talk about rewards, we have to talk about the brain. And in particular, an area of the brain called the nucleus accumbens, which was first studied by two Canadian researchers in the 1940s by the name of Olds and Milner. And Olds and Milner discovered that when they implanted the brains of lab animals with a tiny electrode, and they allowed these lab animals to self-stimulate. They gave them a little lever to press on. And every time they pressed on the lever, they would send a tiny electrical jolt to their nucleus accumbens, what they discovered was that these lab animals pressed on these levers incessantly. They would forgo food and water. They would run across painful electrified grids just to continue to stimulate their nucleus accumbens time and time and time again. In later experiments done on people, they observed similar results. That when people were given a little button to press on, to send electrical current to their nucleus accumbens, they did so hundreds of times. Some of the people in the studies had to have the machines forcibly removed from them, <laughs> even when the power was turned off to get them to stop clicking these buttons. 
Now it turns out that we actually don't need electrodes in our brains to stimulate our nucleus accumbens because your nucleus accumbens is activated every single day with things like luxury goods, sex, junk food, certain chemicals, and of course right there in the center, technology. All of these things activate your nucleus accumbens all day long. Now, Olds and Milner and much of the psychology community believe that the purpose of the nucleus accumbens was to stimulate pleasure, right? Why else would lab animals and later people incessantly activate this part of the brain if it wasn't because it felt good, right? Well, not exactly. What we now know about how the brain prompts us to action, how the brain stimulates us to act, is not by stimulating pleasure per se, but instead activating what we call the stress of desire. Because what we now know that Olds and Milner never did is that the nucleus accumbens becomes most active in anticipation of the reward. But when we actually get the thing that's going to make us feel good, the thing that's finally going to make us happy, that's when the nucleus accumbens becomes less active. So it turns out the way the brain prompts us to action, the way the brain gets us to do these behaviors time and time again, is by creating this itch that we seek to scratch. And there is a way to supercharge that stress of desire. Does anybody want to know how? Variability. Anybody curious? Take it away. Curiosity. Do you just do that? I'm doing it right now. <laughs> exactly. exactly. So when I asked you a question with a question mark at the end there, and I took this long pause and I changed my cadence and I did something a little different, some of you perked up. Why did this guy stop talking? What's going on? <laughs> right? And that bit of mystery, that bit of uncertainty, turns out to be very engaging. The unknown is fascinating. It causes us to engage, it increases focus, and it's highly habit-forming. And of course, this comes from the classic work of B.F. Skinner. Many of you might remember Skinner from your first psychology course in college, right? The father of operant conditioning. Skinner took these pigeons, he put them in a little box, he gave them a disc to peck at, and at first, every time they pecked at this disc, they would get a little food pellet, a little reward. So very quickly, Skinner determined that he could train these pigeons to peck at this disc whenever they were hungry. But then Skinner did something different. Skinner introduced a variable reward. So sometimes the pigeon would peck at the disc, nothing would come out. No food pellet, no reward. The next time the pigeon would peck at the disc, they would receive a reward. And what Skinner observed was that the rate of response, the number of times these pigeons pecked at the disc, increased when the reward was given on a variable schedule of reinforcement. Now, why does this happen? Because we now know that variability spikes activity in the nucleus accumbens, creating this desirous response, this itch of anticipation. And so in all sorts of products that we find most engaging, most habit-forming, think about the things that you just can't put down, you will find one or more of these three types of variable rewards. Rewards of the tribe, rewards of the hunt, and rewards of the self. So let me introduce these to you. Rewards of the self are about these social rewards, things that feel good, have an element of variability, and come from other people. The search for empathetic joy, feeling good because someone else feels good, competition, cooperation, all of these things feel good, have an element of variability, and come from other people. Best example online is, of course, social media. When you open up your Facebook app, there's a lot of uncertainty about what you might find there. Right? What pictures did people post? What are the comments going to say? How many likes does something get? High degree of variability associated with a product like Facebook. There's other examples as well. Stack Overflow, Everybody, every engineer in the room probably uses Stack Overflow, right? 5,000 questions get answered every single day on Stack Overflow. Why? No money has changed hands. What's going on here? Well, it turns out, well, tell, tell an engineer in the room, what happens when you post an answer to Stack Overflow? What happens to your answer? It gets upvoted or downvoted. Right? And there's variability, there's uncertainty there about what your community will think about you. It's not some silly gamification trick, it's not stupid badges and points, it's the opinion of your tribe, of people whose opinions you care about, your fellow engineers. Next comes rewards of the hunt. Rewards of the hunt are all about the search for material possessions. 
This stems from our primal search for food and other, other material goods. And in modern society, we buy these things with money. So when many people think of variable rewards, they think about gambling, right? They think about slot machines, where the variable reward and what makes gambling habit-forming, if not all out addictive, is the currency, right? The, the, the money that you might win by playing one of these games. It turns out that the same exact psychology is at work online. Consider the feed. Have you noticed how everything today has a feed? Why do so many products, everything seems to have a feed today. Why is that? It wasn't the case a few years ago. But now nothing is not built with some kind of feed dynamic. Well, let's take a look at it. For example, LinkedIn, right? When I open my LinkedIn app, ah, the first thing's not very interesting, and the second thing's not very interesting, but oh, maybe the third is interesting. And what do I have to do to get more of that information reward? What do I have to do? Scroll, right? So that scrolling and searching and searching and scrolling is the exact same psychology that keeps me pulling on a slot machine. Same exact psychology at work. Searching and searching and never done searching for that next variable reward. And finally, rewards of the self. Rewards of the self are things that feel good, that have an element of variability, but aren't about the search for material or information rewards. They're not from other people. These are things that feel good in and of themselves. They're intrinsically pleasurable. So the search for mastery, consistency, competency, and control. Good example online is gameplay. Right? So when I'm playing Candy Crush or Angry Birds or Dots or any of these other games, I'm not playing with other people. It's not rewards of the tribe per se. I'm not even really winning anything. There's no rewards of the hunt, but there's something pleasurable about, about getting to the next level, the next accomplishment, the next achievement. And even if you say to me, that's great in here, but listen, you know, I'm not much of a gamer. This doesn't apply to me. I bet you play this game every day. <laughs> Look familiar? I hate that game. I know, right? <laughs> but you can't stop playing it. Right? That unread message that you just have to, have to open so you can clear it away. Or the to-dos on your to-do list that you, you have to check off. Or the one that always gets me is that one app notification on my home screen that I just have to open so I can get it gone. <laughs> are all examples of this variable reward of the self. The search for mastery, consistency, competency, and control. So one word of warning, before you say to yourself, great, variable rewards, I get it, I'm going to put all kinds of variable rewards in my product and it's going to be super habit forming, <laughs> let me give you one bit of warning. And that is that variable rewards are not a free pass. That fundamentally there is a connection between the variable reward and the internal trigger. So if the internal trigger is boredom, well then the variable reward has to entertain. But if the internal trigger is loneliness, seeking connection, well then the variable reward damn well better connect people together. Okay? There has to be a match there. The job of the variable reward is to give the user what they came for, to scratch the user's itch, and yet have a bit of mystery, a bit of uncertainty around what they might find the next time they engage with the product. Or, so some products either insert variability, or some products take inherently variable situations and increase user agency and control. For example, Google would not want to make their search results more variable because searching <laughs> is inherently variable, right? When you have a search query, there's uncertainty about where is my answer. Uber would not want to insert variability. What they're doing is making an inherently variable situation, nameless idea of, you know, am I going to get to where I need to go on time? They're taking that inherently uncertain situation and giving you more agency and control. Okay? They can't remove the uncertainty. They're trying to increase their agency and control over an inherently variable situation. Namely, am I going to get to where I need to go on time? Okay, make sense? All right, so finally, the investment phase. The investment phase is the last part of the hook, and it's where the user puts something into the product in anticipation of a future benefit. It's not about immediate gratification. That's what the action phase is for, for immediate gratification. The investment phase is for a future benefit. Now the purpose of the investment phase is to increase the likelihood of the next pass through the hook. And it does this in two ways. First, the investment loads the next trigger. The investment loads the next trigger. Let me give you an example. When I send someone a message on WhatsApp or Slack or any number of other messaging services, when I invest in the platform by sending a message, 
There's no immediate gratification, right? I don't get any points, I don't get any badges, nothing really happens when I send someone a message. But what I'm doing by investing in the platform and sending a message is that I'm loading the next trigger because I'm likely to get a reply. And that reply comes coupled with that little jewel icon, which is an example of an external trigger, which brings me back through the hook once again. So the first way that investments increase the likelihood of the next pass of the hook is by loading the next trigger. Something that the user does, not some algorithm, not some spammy messaging, something that I do to bring myself back. Okay? That's the first way that investments increase the likelihood of the next pass. The second way that investments increase the likelihood of the next pass to the hook is by storing value. Now, storing value is a very big deal. Storing value is why I love working in technology products as opposed to working with products in the physical world like these chairs and this camera and your clothing. Everything in the physical world depreciates with wear and tear, right? The more we use them, the less valuable they are. But habit-forming technologies can do the opposite. Habit-forming products can appreciate in value. They should get better with use. And they do this because of this principle of stored value. So for example, the more content I put into my Google Drive, the better it becomes as my one and only storage solution. The more data I give to Mint.com or Pinterest, for example, the more data I give these services, the more I can do with them. Right? They become better and better the more data I give them. So if you were to log into my Pinterest account, it actually wouldn't be very interesting for you because it's been tailored for my tastes based on my data, based on my preferences. Followers, right? Followers make a service better and better because they become a better way for someone to reach their audience, to reach other people in their tribe. That's right, right? So if, uh, if Twitter sent out an email tomorrow and said, guess what, Twitter's no longer free, you're going to have to start paying us now, who's more likely to start paying? Is it going to be someone with 10 followers or 10,000 followers? Of course, it's going to be the person with 10,000 followers because they've stored all this value in their follower count. And finally, reputation. Reputation is a form of stored value that users can literally take to the bank. Because my reputation on sites like eBay or TaskRabbit or Airbnb determines what I can charge for my goods and services. And how likely am I to leave one of these platforms after I've invested all this effort in accruing a positive reputation? It's kind of hard to do. It's kind of become sticky. Even if a better product or service comes along, right, I'm unlikely to leave, which brings me to the cold, hard truth that when it comes to the technology business, it's not the best product that always wins. It's not the best product that always wins. Many times, it's the product that's better able to form a consumer habit that carries the day. And it's by running through these four steps of a trigger, action, reward, investment through successive cycles, this is how customer preferences are shaped, how tastes are formed, and how our habits take hold. Now, that was a lot of information. There's a lot more to be found in the book, and I think we're, uh, we're, we've got five comp uh, copies donated by user testing. Thank you very much. There's a lot more in there. But here are the, most, the five most important questions uh, of today's presentation. That if you're building a product that is intended to form a habit. By the way, not every product needs a habit. It's fine if your product doesn't need a habit. But every product that needs a habit needs a hook. And so you've got to be able to answer these five fundamental questions of number one, what's the internal trigger that your product's addressing? What's the user's itch? Number two, what's the external trigger that brings your user to the product? Number three, what's the simplest behavior done in anticipation of a reward? Number four, is the reward fulfilling and yet leaves the user wanting more? And finally, number five, what's the bit of work that the user does to increase the likelihood of the next pass through the hook? Now, before I take some questions, there's one more thing I'd like to discuss. And that is the morality of manipulation. <laughs> I know what that nervous laughter is about. That I'm guessing that many of you during this presentation were thinking to yourself, you know, is this... Is this kosher? Is this all right to do to people to use their hidden psychology to get them to do the things we want them to do? Is that all right? And if you had that reaction, bravo. I think that is the appropriate response to learning about the habit, or the power of these habit-forming products. Because let's face it, any time we are changing people's behavior to meet our ends in mind, that, my friends, is a form of manipulation. 
Because the products we're building here in Silicon Valley, these are the things that people take to bed with them every night. It's the first thing they reach for in the morning before they even say hello to their loved ones. And as Ian Bogo said, our technologies are quite possibly becoming the cigarettes of this century. So what responsibility do we have as designers, as marketers, as innovators, entrepreneurs, as PMs, as engineers, as investors? What responsibility do we have to use the psychology of habit design for good? Well, I encourage you to pick one of the world's problems to fix. That is one thing we have no shortage of. To engage people in something meaningful and something important to help people live happier, healthier, more productive, more connected lives by using the power of habits for good. I encourage you, allow me to borrow from the words of Gandhi, to build the change you wish to see in the world. Thank you very much. So, uh, as I take questions, I have one favor to ask. Uh, can everybody lift up their phones for me? Lift up your phones high for me. Terrific. I have two motives here. One, I want to get a quick picture of you for my own Instagram account here. All right, raise them up high. Terrific. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Second, I just increased your ability. I just made it easier because now the phone's in your hand to take the intended behavior, which is to go to this URL, www.opinion2.us. Notice it's 2.us, not .com. 2.opinion2.us. There you will find a very short five-question survey. I'm constantly tweaking the presentation. Would love to know what you thought about it. Would love to get your feedback. Just a bunch of radio buttons take you all of 30 seconds. After you click Submit, you will be shown a link to my SlideShare page where you can get all the slides you just saw, as well as a lot of other presentations that I've given. Uh, go to the, the presentation that says Hooked, or, uh, sorry, uh, Hooked Model. It says Hooked Model. That's the presentation you just saw. Uh, feel free to share that. Uh, that's, of course, the reward. So I kind of practice what I preach here. <laughs> and with that, I'm happy to take some questions. Great. And we have mics for the questions. So just raise your hand up, and we'll get a mic to you. Okay. Hi. Uh, so, speaking of tweaking the yeah. presentation, um, are there any things in the book that you would like to tweak? That you sort of thought about things more Thank and you very much. Appreciate it. spend some time talking about them and, and using this, these principles with uh, companies. That's a, that's a really good question. There is a lot that's not in the book, uh, some, including some of the stuff you saw is actually not in the book. Um, what's been the biggest insight since writing the book? There's been quite a bit, actually. There's been a lot um, that I've written. You know, I, blo I blog maybe three or four times a month. I have to think about that. What's not in the book? There's a, there's a few concepts. One concept that I think is interesting is, is around finite versus infinite variability. And a lot of times people ask, you know, look, I, I, don't, I don't understand, you know, why aren't games uh, addictive forever? Right? Why don't we all still keep playing games? Aren't games full of variable rewards? Right? Think of Super Mario Brothers and Pac-Man and, and uh, 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 Farmville. Remember Farmville? Man, everybody in the world was playing Farmville for a while. What happened? How come we're not playing Farmville? Isn't that full of variable rewards? Well, the answer to that is let, let's think about what Zynga did after Farmville. Right? What was the next game? After Farmville. Farmville was the most successful game in history at the time. What's the next game that Zynga released after Farmville? Anybody remember? Huh? Cityville. I think it was Cityville. And then Sheffville. And then after Sheffville came Frontierville. And after Frontierville came Farmville 2. And the next Ville. And the next Ville. And the next Ville. And eventually users figured out, hey, this is the same game. <laughs> right? Again and again and again. What was once variable became predictable. So that's an example. Games are an example of a product that has what's called finite variability. It's an experience that after we go through becomes predictable. Right? As much as you love a novel that you've read, very, very, very few novels do you get to the end and say, wow, that was awesome. I want to do the whole thing again. <laughs> right? Very few movies do you walk out of the theater and buy a ticket right away again and see the whole movie again. Right? That almost never, ever happens. Right? These Businesses are not bad businesses. They're just built on these studio models. They're dependent on new, 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 new. Right? Yesterday's newspaper is worth less than nothing. We have to pay someone to haul it away. Because we don't want yesterday's newspaper. We want today's newspaper because we don't know what happened. So that's an example of these businesses that require constant newness, as opposed to products that have what's called infinite variability, 
right? Products like LinkedIn or Twitter, these products use information about our real friends. They use information about people we know. And people we know have much more variability of what's going on in their lives. There's much more variability about what we might see in our feeds. Right? Our friends are going on vacations, they're taking pictures of their pugs, they're posting articles. There's this, this variability around what we might find with these products. And so they tend, to, uh, they tend to, to keep users engaged for longer than these products that have finite variability. I'll think of some others too. I could talk about why I don't like health apps. That's, that's something that wasn't in the book. I wrote an article called, Why Fitness Apps Make You Fat, if anybody has a question about that. <laughs> <laughs> I got one here. One here, okay. Are you familiar with Nest to talk about what's good and what's variable or not variable? Um, not very. I wish I, I don't, I haven't really researched the home automation space. What do you think uh, about it? Well, I mean, there's, a, there's a, the control aspect that's more than just an app. It's obviously a, a value proposition that's about <coughs> more than a consumer-based app. Right. Do you but think it is a control mechanism that... Uh, right. Does it, does it require a habit? Because, by the way, I didn't get to talk about this, but you know, one of the first things I say in the book is that not every product needs a habit. Like, if, if, a, if a product is something that's sold once, a lot of enterprise products have this, right? Where a product is sold, but then never used, right? It just sits in some <laughs> server farm, or it, it's, you know, it, it just kind of runs in the background, but you don't engage with it. That doesn't require a habit, right? The business model doesn't necessitate that. But when you think about products like the ones we discussed, Facebook and Twitter and Slack and WhatsApp and all these products, you know, they would die. They would go out of business if they had to spend on advertising to bring people to their products. Their business models necessitate habits or they go out of business. So I'm not sure if Nest actually requires a habit. It seems to me like a product that's bought, installed, you kind of don't have to use it anymore. But maybe I'm wrong. Remote access. And yeah. There was another question here, I think. Um, so about Google Photos, I'm, coming, I'm in the photo space. Mm -hmm. So Google Photos you know, came out, big, big, uh, big announcement, free storage. I know they're using obviously the data for marketing purposes, but can you see in the future, like you said, once everybody has their photos on Google, free storage, will they start charging with it, uh, charging for the storage? Do you see them? Is that a possibility, or do you think that would deter users? But like you said, once all your data is over there already, trying to transfer it out. <laughs> Um, I don't. I can't speak on Google specifically. I have no <laughs> clue what they're going to do with that. But we do see that once you build investment in a product, uh, you're you're likely to bear things that you wouldn't uh, up front. And I, it's funny. Everybody's tossing out different examples. I can hear like you said, Salesforce. You said, what did you say? I don't know. Stockholm syndrome. So, okay. So there's, <laughs> you know, one example that comes to mind is Facebook, right? So Facebook was telling advertisers. I used to be in the ad business. That was my last company. And at the time. Facebook was pushing super hard on getting likes, right? Getting people following your page and accruing these huge fan bases. And nobody ever knew what exactly fan bases were for. Like, why do we want people to like our page? We don't know, but we need the likes. <laughs> so, and now it's interesting because it used to be when you posted to your, your page, you could pretty much know that your fans were going to see your post. Not so much anymore. Right. <laughs> now you have to pay for it. But I've already invested. Now I have 400,000 people, you know, as subscribing to my page to reach them now I have to pay a little bit well okay you know that I've invested so much in it already so we're seeing that dynamic already play out you know when we invest in something when we put effort in something it becomes more valuable to us so how do you how do you go about uh, having reinforcing an existing habit or a habit you already you already established versus creating a new habit and Many times, many times with our products, we, we look at data all the time. We see what are people doing. How do we make it easier on them? But maybe a lot of the times, it's there's more value in creating a new habit. Right. But it's also hard to to predict to if it's right. going to work. And so this is a terrific question. I think the core of your question is how do you capture somebody else's habits? Right? These internal triggers that we talked about, these are age-old internal triggers. Right? We're not making internal triggers. We're catering to them. Right? Our goal, a product. A product's goal is to scratch these itches. So loneliness and uncertainty and fatigue and boredom and, and, and seeking connection, these are age-old problems, right? They've been with us for, you know, since the dawn of humanity. And there are, have always been solutions to these problems in one form or another. So the question I, th I think you're asking is, look, you know, what if somebody already has the association with your internal trigger, right? What if somebody already owns boredom, 
and you're trying to break that consumer habit and bring those users to form a habit with your product instead. Is that kind of what you're asking? Uh, yeah, but more, more like what if you're already addressing one habit, but uh, you're thinking about maybe addressing that or establish another habit, but it's, uh, you don't know if it's going to work out, so the easier path is keep, keep working on what you, what you already have. Okay, so that's actually a slightly different one. So um, everybody, this is the Lean group. I don't have to explain Lean startup methodologies, right? We all know Build, Measure, Learn. You, this is not a free pass to get away from Build, Measure, Learn. You still have to go through Build, Measure, Learn. But let me ask you something. What's the most expensive part of Build, Measure, Learn? Where does all the blood, sweat, and tears and money all go? The building, right? The measuring and the learning, that's fun. Once you've set up the infrastructure in your organization to do that, that's fun. It's the building that's so expensive. So what I propose is that we don't just ask customers. Customer development is great. We need to do that. We need to listen to what customers tell us for sure. But there's all these inarticulatable needs. There's all these things that drive customer behavior in ways they can't tell us. And so for those type of needs, we need to dig deeper and have some kind of framework to help us inform what to build. And that framework should come from, I think, consumer psychology so that we can spend more time coming up with the right hypotheses to build the right thing so that we can fail less. That's the goal. You're still going to fail. You're still going to go through build, measure, learn. But what I hope is when you decide, okay, what do we build next? It's not just what the highest paid officer says. It's not what the VC says. It's not what our loudest customer says. It's built with some kind of logic, some kind of framework around what's required to drive user behavior. I'm not sure what the mic is. <coughs> Uh, you've danced around this question a few times now, but I thought I would ask it head on. Okay. Um, so you've given a lot of great examples of kind of like consumer-facing apps and games and social networks. I'm curious uh, if you have some examples of these kind of techniques being applied to enterprise software, kind of business software, those right. types of scenarios. Sure. So as I mentioned earlier, if, if your product is a one-time use product, you don't need habits whatsoever. It's just not, you know, not required for your business model. Uh, but if your product requires unprompted engagement, consumer or enterprise, you need a hook. So there's, I, I, talk, I usually, for, for mixed audiences, I always talk about consumer because these are products that people are familiar with, right? If I ask, you know, enterprise products uh, like Salesforce, maybe you've used it, maybe you haven't. Medallia, maybe you've used it, maybe you haven't. Uh, GitHub, maybe you've used it, maybe you haven't. A lot of people know Instagram, and Facebook, and Twitter. So those are more, more of the examples. I have actually the exact same presentation with the exact same hook model, if you go to that SlideShare page that I, at the end of my survey, look for hooked in the enterprise. There's a presentation where all the consumer examples are enterprise examples, and I talk about how you see uh, the hook in, in various enterprise products. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So my question is um, here. Where, oh, there's so, uh, voice of God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my question is, what might make people de-associate their exist habits? Say, if I want to create um, Facebook, or what can make people to quit break. Facebook? Okay, perfect. So this was uh, what the question I thought you were asking before is how do you break an existing habit so that you can kind of steal that, that customer habit away from your competition? So there's three ways to do that. There's three ways to capture a, 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 your competitor's consumer habit. Number one is to run them through the hook with greater velocity. Okay, so run them through trigger, action, reward, and investment faster than your competitor. And that typically happens with an innovation in the action phase. Okay? The, the nature, if you boil down all innovation from the cotton gin to the iPhone, is fundamentally around shortening the distance between the need and the remedy. Right? So if you can figure out a way to make that happen faster, if you can cycle them through trigger action reward investment faster than your competitor by doing something generally innovating in that, in that uh, action phase, that's one way to capture a habit. The second way, so the first is velocity through the hook. The second way is through greater frequency of passing through the hook. So velocity is different from frequency throughout their day. And this has happened over the past several years as the interface has changed. So when we went from desktop to laptop to mobile and now to wearable, every time we've made this shift, our access to these technologies has become easier. And so we use these products more frequently. And every time there's an interface change, the habit deck gets reshuffled. There's new opportunities for little guys to beat the incumbents. Because oftentimes, most often, the incumbents can't switch interfaces. They do a crummy job of porting, or their business models don't let the, the, the product shift over to the new interface. 
Okay? So, and that's an example of more frequently passing through these hooks throughout our day. So velocity through the hook, frequency th through the hook, and then the third way is by making the reward more rewarding. So that critical third step of the hook, the reward phase, where the user's itch is scratched. If you can build a product that scratches the user's itch better than the incumbent, better than the existing solution, and not just a little bit better, uh, Peter Thiel quotes a Harvard study that tells us that it has to be nine times better, that's when you stand a chance. So let me give you an example. Why is Facebook terrified of Snapchat? Well, one of the reasons, think about it here, right? So what makes Snapchat such a, like, what, what makes it different? What, what, what happens when you receive a message from WhatsApp, I'm sorry, on uh, Snapchat versus a message on, on Facebook? What's the different? What's special about Snapchat? Disappears. Your message dis disappears, right? It explodes. It's gone. So what does that do to the ability curve of the sender? It makes it easier. They're more likely to send with less discretion, right? They send flirty pics and sexy pics, and we, we know what kind of pics people are sending, right? <laughs> so what does that do for the receiver, right? You've just received two messages, one from your Aunt Matilda on Facebook or one from somebody you just flirted with on Snapchat. Which one is going to have a more rewarding reward? <laughs> right? The Snapchat one, right? The reward is more rewarding. It's more interesting. It does a better job of scratching this itch of a moment of entertainment, right? A moment to relieve our boredom. So that's the third way. So velocity through the hook, frequency of passing through the hook, or making the reward more rewarding. Okay. Oh, I don't know where the mic is. Hi. So I had a question around the power of manipulation. Okay. Do Great. You, do you think uh, regulation is the way to address that? Yeah, thank you for asking this, by the way. It's 50-50 uh, people will ask this question because I think, I think people are scared. So, um, Am I evil? A are you evil? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Let me, well, I'll give you a test to ask yourself if you're being evil. So one of the chapters in the book is called The Morality of Manipulation. And uh, I, I give people a two-part test. And I'm going to give you this two-part test. You don't have to answer out loud. The two-part test... It's not quite so dramatic of, of, of are you evil. It's not quite that. It's a test to figure out what's worth spending your time on. What, when, what is it worthy of your time to change users' behavior? And so here's the test. The first question is, is what I'm working on materially improving people's lives? That's the first question. Is what I'm working on materially improving people's lives? But that's not good enough. Okay? That's not good enough. The second question is, am I the user? Am I the user? Now. Why do I give both those questions? Does anybody know what the first rule of drug dealing is? What's the first rule of drug dealing? Don't get high. Never get high on your own supply. That's the first rule of drug dealing. So what am I doing by making you take this two-part test? I'm making you get high on your own supply because I'm asking if you are the user. Now, if you answer negative in either of those questions, it's not necessarily that you're not going to make money. It's not that you're not going to have a successful business. Right? But if you care about the morality of manipulation, if you want to be on the right ethical side, I think that two-part test of saying, look, I'm making a product that I, materially, I believe materially improves people's lives, and it's for me, it's a product I need. And you're what I call a facilitator. And if you look at who founded these companies, right, all the companies I just mentioned, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, and WhatsApp, all of these companies were founded by facilitators, people who did believe and still believe that their products materially improve people's lives and they themselves were the user. So not only does that put you in a good moral position, I think, but it also turns out to be a huge competitive advantage because one of the hardest things about building great products is understanding what your user wants. And what better under way to understand what your user wants than by building for somebody you understand very intimately, right? Some people say, well, I don't have that luxury and yeah, how are we gonna solve all the global issues that are outside of Silicon Valley? Yes, yes, and yes. Right? Those are all great points, but in terms of a framework that you can ask yourself, how do, what, where's my most, where am I most likely to be successful without doing a lot of, of ethnographic research, which sometimes we have to do, but without doing a lot of that, turning to yourself and building a product that you believe materially improves people's lives and you're the user, I think puts you in a really good spot. And um, the regulation question, that's where you originally asked. So I actually think there's, there's a few parties here that are involved. There's also the, the, you know, there's us, the makers, the workers who make these products. There's the user, and of course the user has a certain sense of responsibility. Uh, and then there's the, the, the company themselves, right? So there's, there's a lot of parties involved here. And so one of the things that I want companies to do who are making potentially habit-forming products, and by the way, this is a tiny proportion of companies, right? When we talk about the vast majority of people who call me, 
I don't think I've ever gotten a call from, from somebody needing my help or needing consulting services that says, hey, look, our product is, is you know, too engaging, right? <laughs> like, that, that never happens. There's certain clients I won't take. Like, I don't work for gaming companies. I don't work for pornography companies. I don't work for certain industries. I don't work for alcohol companies. Um, so, but, but the vast majority of people in this room are not struggling with, oh, my gosh, my product is too engaging. You know, the vast majority of startups are, are struggling with nobody gives a shit, right? <laughs> like, nobody's <laughs> engaging with my product. But if companies are making products, that are potentially addictive, not habit forming. Habit forming and addiction is different, right? A habit is just a behavior done with little or no conscious thought. An addiction is a behavior that actually hurts the user, okay? and they can't stop doing that behavior. So there's a different definition to an addiction from a habit. So what I think companies should do who are making potentially addictive products is to have what I call a use and abuse policy. And I've written about this in, in TechCrunch a few times now, that I think companies should say, look, if we're making a product that's potentially addictive, we should have some number that's too much, right? Maybe after you stop, uh, maybe after you use Facebook for 40 hours a week, 50 hours a week, maybe we should say, hey, you're showing addictive tendencies here. Here are some resources, or here are some things you can do. You know, Stack Overflow. <laughs> it's not so ridiculous. Stack Overflow already does this. Did you know that if you use Stack Overflow more than 20 hours a week, you can't accrue any more points? They break the hook. They have a breaker that doesn't let you accrue any more points. Why? Because Jeff Atwood, one of the co-founders of Stack Overflow, wanted Stack Overflow to be something that enhances users' life and doesn't become their life. So in the very small portion of companies that are potentially addicted, not just habit-forming, I think that's, that's a solution to explore. Uh, now the interesting thing is that some companies can't do this. Right? Some companies' business model, and I'm not going to name names, but there are some companies whose business model requires not just habituated behavior, but addictive behavior. And actually, I don't think Facebook is one of those companies. Facebook would do just fine if everybody used it a few hours a week. But there are some gaming, and there's, did I say gaming companies? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. There are some companies that just couldn't survive without the small proportion of users who are these time whales, right? These people who spend, you know who they are. They spend so much time on these games, and those, unfortunately, the business model would crumble if those people stopped playing. And that's scary. So that's, that might be a situation where we might require some kind of regulation, I think, in the future. Let's take maybe two more questions. Okay. Where's the mic? Right here? Yeah. Do you want to bring him a mic? He's been asking the poor guy. That's all right. Oh. oh, thank you. So I'm, in, in most of this discussion, the focus has been on, to a certain extent, engaging the user with the app. And I'm curious how this model, uh, you would see it changing when to a certain extent, the goal is to remove the app. So you were talking, you know, like fitness. The goal of a fitness application shouldn't be, you know, let me get you really engaged with continuing to use this fitness app. It should be, you know, you should have the inherent inherent internal trigger to just go out and have a run Doing without yourself. the app telling you to do it. Right. So how does this kind of change when the goal is not consistent engagement with the app, where it's really more as a vehicle to facilitate change right. that then gets internalized. Right, so remember I, I talked about how these are in, in series. So it's not just one hook, it's one hook forming a habit and then creating the next user habit and the next user habit. And so um, where I think a lot of health companies have, have failed is either they don't do a good job of, of hooking people in the first place, right? Even if they could just solve users' problems of getting them in the walking habit of their exercise habit in the first place, that would be terrific. We know the stats show that they do a pretty horrible job of that. Uh, but then there's even this other problem where even if you, f if you fix the user, so to speak, if you give them what they want, which is this new habit of exercise, then they don't need you anymore, right? They stop using the product. And so what I've been seeing lately are companies that take users from one habit to the next. And that habit so far, what I've seen is this model where at first you come as just a user of the product, you're a consumer of the product, and then you become a contributor to the product. Hmm. So then you become, I, I like this model that I've been calling each one help one. That there's a product that I invested in called Seven Cups of Tea. Seven Cups of Tea was in a Y Combinator class uh, a few classes ago. They called me actually when it was just one guy, Glenn Moriarty. He's a, he's a psychotherapist who really wanted to get into tech and he saw this problem where he found that therapy is, is very difficult for most people to go to. That you know, if you think about a, a soldier, a veteran who has PTSD, or the parent of a child with a severe disability. These are people who need therapy. They need someone to talk to. And yet, if you think about how difficult it is to go see a, a doctor to help you, a therapist to help you, it's expensive, it's hard, it's socially awkward, it's time consuming. Well, Glenn makes this app 
that connects people with the touch of a button to a trained listener. Right? So whenever you need someone to talk to, you have this internal trigger of sadness, depression, you need someone to talk to, you've instantly got someone on the line. Okay, so that's the first hook. Great. Now here's the kicker. As you are listened to, you are offered training to become a listener yourself. And it's those people who can make that transition, who learn how to be a listener themselves and help the next person, those people get better with similar results to professional therapy. It's amazing. And it's all free. So these are examples, I think, of these products that need to successfully transition from just doing the behavior to actually becoming part of this rewards of the tribe to help someone else. It's the ultimate user-generated content. To right, right. Exactly. Okay, last question. Is there someone over here in the back? Okay. Hey, dear. Hello. So I have more of a, or less of a technical question. Um, so when I think of um, products that, that essentially form um, habit-forming consent, like initiatives, I think of uh, product hunt. Right. And I think in, in the form of uh, FOMO. Um, so thinking about product hunt and then thinking about Ryan Hoover, how did, how did your relationship with Ryan Hoover come about uh, for the book? Yeah. Um, so does, that, does anybody use product hunt here? Oh, yeah, good. A lot of people. Okay. So Product Hunt um, is an interesting story. So Ryan reached out to me. Uh, that's this guy, Ryan Hoover, right below my name. And had I, had I known who Ryan Hoover would, would become today, I would have made that name bigger. Uh, <laughs> Ryan Hoover is the CEO of Product Hunt. And um, so the story is that uh, 2012, December 2012, Ryan Hoover sends me an email and says, Hey, I've been reading your stuff on TechCrunch. I really like your writing. And uh, I'm just really interested in what you're doing. I'm working this job that, you know, it's okay, and I've got some free time on my hands. I just want to help you. Like, what do you need done that I can help you with? Uh, so I said, you know, come on down. We had a burger here at the counter on California Avenue. And uh, I said, look, I've been writing for a couple years now, and I'm thinking about putting together a book. Can you help me kind of edit it and put it together so that it's in a cohesive format as opposed to a bunch of blog posts? He was awesome. We worked on it for several months, and, and uh, uh, he helped me find examples. A lot of the screenshots you see are from Ryan's laptop and cell phone. And, uh, of course, the next thing that, that Ryan did after, after we, we finished uh, the book, uh, he says, look, I've got this idea. I'm, I'm thinking about starting a company. I immediately said, look, let me an angel invest. I want, I'm in. Uh, and then, of course, you know, nobody knows the hook model second to me better than Ryan. We wrote the book together. And so I'm, I'm thrilled to see that Product Hunt has, has done so well and has these, these fantastic hooks built in. All right, so um, if there was a question that I didn't get to answer, uh, feel free to go on my website. There's a contact me form there. You can always send me a, a question there. I'm happy to, uh, to check those out if you, if you send it through my website. Also, uh, I do office hours. Every week I do one hour of office hours in 15-minute increments. If there's something you read in the book or you have a quick question that something didn't make sense, happy to chat. Uh, if you go to the upper right-hand corner of my blog, it says schedule time with me. Feel free to, to check that out. And, um, yeah, with that, thank you to our sponsors, and thank you for coming. Thanks, Nir, for an awesome talk.